All right, the next thing that I want to do is do a quick review of the horrors of concurrent programming. So we have two problems that we've run into here as soon as we have things happening concurrently. And those two problems are data races and deadlock. So if this course had exams, one of the things that would be on the exam is I would ask you to list what the conditions are for a data race. There's a bunch of ways to phrase this, but I'm looking for a particular set of things. So quick, do you remember what they are? All right, if you don't, here they are. The first thing that we need is concurrent execution. And we need at least two processes or threads. And if we don't have concurrent execution, we don't have to worry about the, the this problem at all. Data races are a concurrency problem. We need to have shared data between the processes and the two processes need to actually share it. They need to do something with it. If we have like just a region that's M mapped, map shared that one process uses and the other process doesn't, then we can't have a data race because they aren't actually using the shared data. Now, once we have concurrent execution and shared data that both processes are actually using, at least one process needs to do a write. If both processes are only doing reads, then there's no problem. Now, once we have a data race, or once we have a program where we have concurrency, we have to worry about data races. And if we find something that's a data race, we can solve that in, uh, I mean, in a couple of ways. But the main plan that we have for solving a data race is adding a lock. So the idea with a lock is each piece of shared data should be protected by a lock. So assuming that we want to solve our data races with a lock, we want to make sure that each piece of data is protected by a lock. And then uh, a process must lock the lock before accessing that shared data. So if we have two processes, either of them is allowed to access the shared data as long as first it locks the lock, then accesses the shared data, and we wanna make sure that we unlock the lock when we're done and optimally as quickly as possible. And the way locks work, They work by preventing concurrency. The lock says only one process can access the shared data at a time. Now we're going to have sort of like a sequence of separate processes sequentially accessing the same data, but never do we have a situation where um, one process can be in the middle of doing something that's multiple steps, and then the other process is going to start accessing the data at the same time. The locks allow us to control what our sort of atomic operations are on the shared data. And then it's up to us as the programmer to make sure that that sort of atomic operation chunk that we've defined with the locks is sufficient to make our program do the right thing. It needs to actually solve the data race. Unfortunately, there's a problem. Now, if we have more than one lock, we have to worry about deadlocks. Uh, the condition is we have to have circular weight. So if we don't actually wait on locking a lock, we might be able to avoid deadlock. If we can't have the locks in a cycle, like if we can't be attempting to lock the locks in a cycle, we don't necessarily have a problem. And I talked a little bit before about lock ordering which is a pattern that can be followed in an entire software project, an entire program, 
to try to avoid deadlocks. And if you strictly follow the pattern, you'll avoid deadlocks. But that requires a certain amount of buy-in from the developers and 100% compliance. But that's sort of the basic problem that we're dealing with. All right, after that review, the next thing that I want to talk a little bit about is semaphores. So I guess this thing isn't really review, it's uh, parallel programming concepts and tools. I don't know. Next thing that I want to talk about is semaphores. So a semaphore is an integer. And it's an integer that has two associated operations. We have semweight. And what semweight is going to do is it's going to attempt to decrement the integer. Now, the integer that is a semaphore is a non-negative integer. Sort of, that's the idea. And so we can't make it go negative, that's the rule. But what this means is, for example, we built a lock out of a semaphore. The way we built a lock out of a semaphore is we started the value of the semaphore at one, and then we use semweight as the lock operation. So the first process that tries to decrement succeeds. It lowers the value of the semaphore from one to zero. And then if a second process comes along and tries to decrement, it's going to attempt to lower it from zero to negative one. That is not allowed. We can't lower the value of the semaphore below zero. So the process is going to block instead. All right, the other option operation is sempost. And that increments the value. Now, if any process is blocked on attempting to decrement the semaphore, we're going to give it another try. And so if 10 processes are waiting to decrement the semaphore, logically we let each of them try again. Some of them may succeed because we just incremented. I mean, at least one is going to succeed because we just incremented. And then it will get to continue past its sem weight operation. But if we just are at zero, have five processes waiting on the semaphore, we sem post once, one of the five processes will wake up, and the other four processes are going to end up staying blocked, waiting for someone else to post to the semaphore. So this allows us to restrict access to a resource or a region of code to some fixed number of processes. Another example, other than building a lock of where we might want to use a semaphore, probably we wouldn't, but where we could use a semaphore is imagine we were writing a program that like made network connections and crawled the web and downloaded a bunch of websites. And we wanted to limit it to having four concurrent processes uh, attempting to browse the web at the same time. These processes also do other things once they get data, but we only want four processes concurrently doing network requests. And so we can start a semaphore at an initial value of four. Every time a process wants to start doing a network request, it does a sem wait. When it's do done, it does a sem post. And now we have a guarantee that only four processes at a time will be doing network requests. Now, another thing that we can do here is that if we start with a value of zero, then processes can 
call sem wait and immediately block until sem post is later called. This idea that we might want to have some processes start up and immediately block is also useful. Imagine we have a job queue where we're going to have a worker thread uh, start up and then as jobs are submitted to the queue, the worker thread is supposed to wake up and do work or worker process. So if we start the semaphore at a value of zero, then every time a job is added to the queue, we call sem post. That'll cause a worker thread to wake up and go attempt to do the job. All right, so with this idea of a semaphore, the next thing that I want to do is I want to take a quick look at the starter code for homework, um, homework six. Uh, let me just download it from the web of Majig. So if I, you'll have to believe me that I'm over at Inkfish grabbing our homework six starter code. So this is homework six starter. And then we'll unpack this. So in the starter code, we get a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that we get is a barrier. Now the idea of a barrier is it's not really a, well, it's one of the primitives that we can use that could be provided by an operating system or a library in order to try to avoid data races and control concurrency. So the idea of a barrier is that we're going to synchronize the execution of a fixed number of processes. And the idea is they're going to run code before the barrier. They're going to hit the barrier and block. And they're going to block until all of the processes in this fixed group of processes um, so it's a group of processes of a fixed size so we're going to start these processes they're going to all run the code before the barrier so i guess we have like some code Then we have a barrier, then we have more code, and the, the like number one code runs in all of the processes in parallel. Then the processes hit barrier wait, and they're going to wait until everybody has finished the code in area one. Then after all processes have hit the barrier, They're all going to approximately simultaneously start running the code after the barrier. And this is potentially useful because we can break up data races by making it so that operations that processes are doing before the barrier cannot add up to a data race with operations that uh, stuff is doing after the barrier. For example, We have four processes filling in an array of so we have four processes numbered zero through three filling in an array of size four. Each process um, writes to data sub pp, sub its process number. Then each process reads from the whole array. 
So if we're going to have each process filling in data in one slot in the array, there's no data race here because we aren't sharing data. Each process gets its own array slot. And then if all the processes are reading at the same time, there's no data race here. But if we're doing both of these things potentially concurrently, there is a data race. And the problem is if one process finishes its work uh, writing to its slot in the array and then starts reading, well, another process isn't done, then we have two processes concurrently accessing the data. At least one of them is writing. And if we put a barrier in the middle, we can eliminate that data race because we know that the write phase is done for all the processes before the read phase starts. And so we don't have a data race. So that's the idea. So you're actually given a barrier in homework six as the recommended way to solve, well, as the required way to solve your um, couple of data races that you have in the assignment. Let's take a quick look at the barrier implementation itself. So the public interface is that we have an object called a barrier, a struct, and then we have three functions, one that makes a barrier, one that frees a barrier, and one that waits on a barrier. And when we create the barrier, we're going to specify how many processes it supports. So how big is this process group that is going to be interacting with the barrier? And then in the barrier code itself, uh, make barrier. So the barrier itself is two semaphores and two integers. So we're going to start off with that count field is going to get filled in with the number of processes that we expect to see. And then we have a scene field, which is going to keep track of how many processes have hit the barrier. When scene gets up to count, it's going to be time to let all of the processes continue on past the barrier. Now we have two semaphores. We have one called barrier and one called mutex. The one called mutex is just a lock. We're going to initialize it with an initial value of one. So the seminit function, that's not what I wanted to do. This seminit function takes three arguments. It takes a semaphore to initialize. It's going to take the okay it's going to take a flag to say whether this is a shared mutex that's always going to be one when we're, or sorry a shared semaphore when we're working with processes and then it's going to take the value the integer that is the initial value of the semaphore so this number here is showing that we're initializing this semaphore named mutex with a value of one so we can use it as a lock now the semaphore named barrier we're initializing as a value of zero and what that means is that if anybody waits in the semaphore, they're just going to block. And for a barrier, that's actually what we want. We want a bunch of processes to block until it's time for them all to wake up. So our barrier wait operation is where all the real work gets done here. We're going to use our mutex to avoid data races on the semaphore, or sorry, on the barrier content itself. Then we're going to increment the scene thing. A process is waiting, so we've seen one more process waiting. Then we're going to remember that. And then we're going to unlock the mutex. Now, if scene is equal to count, then the process that is calling barrier wait right now is the last process that we need to call barrier wait to wake everybody up. So we're going to go through and loop, and we're going to post to the barrier count times in order to wake everybody up who's already waiting. Now, not only are we going to wake everyone up who's already waiting, we're going to post one more time for ourselves. And so then if we had woken, if we are the process that wakes everybody up, when we call semWait, uh, the value of the sum of four is one, and so we keep going. If we were not the final process, then we don't execute this if, and we're just going to wait. And the value of the barrier is zero, so we're going to wait until the final process hits the barrier and wakes everyone up. So that's how that barrier works. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's what I wanted to cover now. I think I have one more like concept piece to do, but I'll do that as a separate video.